from Procter and Gamble and British Airways, but lots of other organisations I've worked with around the world since then. And I work, you know, a lot in financial services as well. And I haven't found a financial services organisation yet where it's not relevant. You know, I've added the, I've added the, the Bank Nagara in this week. That was Monday of this week. So I, decided, I thought for your benefit I would add them in today. So. You see, I'm now an expert on Malaysia, you see. That's um, but the model I work with is a very simple one. And the model works something like this. What it says is, look, everything starts with the customer. Any kind of transformation must start with the customer. And being better able to understand the customer than your competitors. You then move into how you set the customer promise. And I'll talk about customer promises. We're going to do a lot of that customer promises until the break. Then we move into, when you have your customer promise, what does that mean for your product and service and your communication? Where does that fit? Well, that's a model I'm going to take you through. I'm going to talk about how we understand customers, how we make that into a promise for the customer, how it then affects what we do, how it affects how we communicate. And another reason why I believe that's relevant is I was taken through some of your work that you're doing on your values and your competencies or whatever recently. And looking at your tiger scheme, you know, when I looked at what are the lessons I'm going to talk about about how to make this happen, I realized there was a big link. You know, I'm going to talk a lot about teamwork. Integrity, that's up to you. <laughs> but I'm told that you are very good. Um, but I am going to, obviously, this is a platform for growth. I am going to talk about some stuff to do with excellence and efficiency. I'm also going to show some ideas from other places that might help you think of new ways of doing efficiency. Some places, nothing to do with banking. Um, and it's all about relationships. Because to make transformation happen, it's about how you work together. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But also, when I looked at your leadership competence framework and, your, and search, you know, again, it's the same thing. I'm talking about a way of looking at strategy to do with how you put the customer at the center of your transformation. It's about people to make it happen. Of course, we're looking at achievement. Relationships comes in again. Clearly, a big part of what I'm talking about is you talk customer centricity, it's right in the middle of my thing, and it has to be. Um, and of course, the whole subject is transformation, so innovation and change. So I hope that as we go through, you will see a link to what you're doing, and I, I will play back that link anyway. But the starting point is this. Leadership of transformation, internal or external, for me, has to start with the customer. It has to start with the customer. And it has to start about thinking differently about our customers. And this is what I've learned. And I'm going to take you through a little bit about Procter & Gamble and what I learned there about customers. But before I do that, just to ask, you know, who are your customers? If we take your external customers, first of all, who are your external customers? You shout at me if you like. You know, if I were to say, who are your customers? What are they? Are they the general public? Yes? Right. Who else? Any, anything else apart from the general public that might you think of as a customer or a stakeholder? Corporations? Yes? Companies? Yes? The regulator? The regulator is very much an external customer of yours. Yes, absolutely. You know, it's more than just the public who bank with you, isn't it? And I don't know, but I assumed it would be things like the public, the regulator, suppliers. I didn't put corporates on there. I should have done. I apologize. You know, but yeah, there's lots of potential external customers, all of which have an influence on what you do, all of which you need to understand in a different way. Equally, you have another kind of customer, don't you, for your work? The internal customer. Yeah? And who's the internal customer? It's the other departments you work with. It might be your team, if you're a leader of a team. It might be your boss. They're all, I mean, in fact, it's not, it might be, they are. They are all your customers as well. So when I talk about principles of customer understanding, think about this. It's both internal and external, okay? Because you need both if we're going to go through. So what have I learned about customer understanding? Well, principle number one I'm going to play with this morning is the idea of what I call soft insights. Soft insights. Right, what does that mean? Right. Let me take you back a few years. In the 1970s and the early 1980s, okay, customer understanding was all about data and information at Procter & Gamble, in consumer goods. You know, in P&G, you were a good brand manager if you had lots of information about your customer. The mark of a good, the signal of a good brand manager was the size of the cabinet, filing cabinet in your office. Look at all the data I've got. I must be very clever. And um, that was fine. And it was a big competitive advantage. But the problem happened from there on. Because during the 1980s, there was a growth of a new industry. One you'll know very well, the market research industry. 
And all of a sudden, there are many firms out there that are collecting information and data about customer groups, and they're able to sell it to anybody. So all of a sudden, Procter & Gamble's competitors were able to buy information. So the fact that P&G had it was no longer an advantage, because other people could get data. So P&G said, that's a problem. We need to do different kinds of data research. They introduced new research techniques. But then, along came this thing called the computer. And then along came this other thing called the internet. And all of a sudden, at the press of a button, everybody can get as much information as they like. Your competitors can get as much information that way as you can. They can connect into the internet the same as you. So how do we get an advantage? How are we going to get better, superior customer understanding when everybody has access to information? The answer from P&G was soft insights. Soft insights are at the margin. This is the extra things you can find that might make that difference for your customer. And soft insights are about your ability to immerse yourself in your customer's world, to really understand not what does your customer want, but what does it feel like to be your customer? What does it feel like to live in their world? And you might pick up soft things like the language they use, the story about their life, what's good, what's bad, what gets in the way. Feelings, now there's one. You know, my academic background, okay, is largely driven by quantitative techniques. I was an econometrician when I did an economics degree, okay? So I grew up with statistics and numbers and modeling and this sort of thing. And all of a sudden, I've got a boss who says, tell me about the feelings of your customer. Okay, what? Where are the numbers? Give me a score for the feelings. Oh, give me a score out of 10. And it was tough, but it was one of the best lessons I ever learned because feelings drive behavior. And if we can understand the feelings today and the feelings we would like our customers to have, that's when we have the key to really unlocking the potential. And um, that's the problem. And, and, it's, and it's little things about soft insights that, for me, have been the difference that I've seen in big businesses. Now, I'm going to show you some case studies as we go through today from Procter & Gamble, from, you know, from Eurostar, from VA. But I'm going to do a very simple little one, first of all, about why I believe soft insights are important. I'm going to introduce you to the world of the SOC. Okay? Here we have a sock. Okay? This sock looks like a normal sock outside the shoe. Okay? Outside the shoe, it is black. Once you go inside to your shoe, what do you have? Silly colors. Yeah? These socks, if you go to the UK, to the biggest retailer of socks in the UK, this kind of sock is about 30% of all of the socks that they sell. Socks with stupid colours on the heel and the toe, black elsewhere. Why? Did somebody go and big, do a big market research survey and say, I've done a huge analysis of the market and there is clearly a demand for socks with stupid colours on them? <laughs> what happened was somebody immersed themselves in the customer's world. They spent time in the world of the sock. In the household, they looked at what goes on in the house. What's the biggest problem with socks in the house? Absolutely. Finding the other one. <laughs> Pairing them up after the wash. So somebody thought to themselves, you know, it's not a big deal, but it's annoying. Maybe if you come up with a solution to that problem, maybe people will buy your socks. So clearly this sock is not a pair with that sock. Yeah? They're clearly from different pairs. So it's very obvious the solution to the problem. Now, I don't know if these socks are stronger than other socks. I don't know if they're warmer. I don't know if they're better quality. But it doesn't matter. Because they've solved my little problem inside the house, a third of households are buying these socks. Now, that may sound silly and little, and it's not big high finance, it's just socks. But I tell you, if I own the franchise to sell a third of the socks to Marks & Spencer, the biggest seller of socks in the UK today, I would not be here. I would be on my big yacht in the Mediterranean. In that kind of sort, okay? It's a big business. But it came from just this extra little bit of understanding. And that's what I would say is the key, particularly when you're a leader like you are, is the how you go to that next stage. Um, I had a classic one, actually, that happened to me, I remember, um, a while ago. I was um, doing some work in Malta. Have you heard of Malta? It's an island in the Mediterranean, the island of Malta. And I was doing some work down there, and I was going back to my home in Edinburgh, in Scotland. 
And uh, you can't fly direct, so you have to go via Amsterdam in, uh, in Holland, in the Netherlands. So I got to Amsterdam Airport, and they announced, here's the flight to Edinburgh. I thought, oh, fantastic, good. Um, we went through the gate. They put us on a bus. Okay? They said, we're going to take you on a bus to the airplane. I thought, oh, great, okay, fine, you know. Um, it's a big airport, Amsterdam. It's normally a long drive. But I thought, that's okay, that's okay. They put us on the bus. This is a bus built for about 45 people. There are 75 of us on this bus. <laughs> it's not good news. Okay, we're like this, absolutely crammed in, you know, like this. And it's a very hot day, and it's not good news. So we drive around the airport, and eventually we get to the bottom of the steps into the aircraft. And we're standing there, and the sweats are pouring, and feeling really uncomfortable. And um, the driver gets out. He walks into the aircraft. He comes back downstairs, and he says, you're going to have to wait. And he just walks off and sits in his cab and gets his newspaper out. <laughs> and thought, oh dear. So we're like this, thinking this is very uncomfortable. Five minutes we stood there. Now, five minutes may not sound like a long time, but when you're standing like this in the hot place, it's a long time. And eventually, up on the stairs, through the door, we saw the cabin crew, the stewardesses, came into sight. And we thought, at last, yes, they completely ignored us. They were up the top there, with their back to us, having a little chat with their friends, you know, have a little talk. No, uh, nothing to do with us. We're like this, watching it. <laughs> then we got a great demonstration. Have you ever watched any of you make a cup of coffee on an aeroplane in the galley? We got to watch that. We saw them go out, they made a nice coffee. It, nice, two big, nice cups of coffee. We saw them take them through to the pilots, who we could see through their window. The pilots said, thank you very much. And we're like this, watching it all going on. <laughs> After 15 minutes, you've got 70 or so very, very unhappy passengers, yeah? Very unhappy. And eventually they let us out. And, and people are angry now. So they're getting on board the aircraft, and they're getting quite angry with each other, you know. I cleared that space for my bag. Why have you put that your bag in there? Tell your child to stop kicking my seat. And it was all, for me, I remember it was my jacket. I'd taken off my jacket, and I was holding it when I walked on, because it was very hot. And the lady said... I'll just take that from you in a minute, sir, as I got on board, which was very nice of her. But the problem is, she didn't. And five minutes later, I'm still sitting with my jacket. Now, on a normal day, that would not be the slightest concern to me. Okay, she's forgotten, no problem. But today, they made me wait for 15 minutes on that bus, so I was not happy. Um, so it's all going well. We go through the flight, halfway through the flight, um, the captain comes on to make an announcement. Sorry about the delay. We had a problem with the air conditioning. We needed to get the engineer to come and fix something. So lesson number one, well, why not tell us that at the beginning? Then at least we understand. But what did they then do? They went through the aeroplane, and they gave us all a copy of the KLM passenger survey. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but, you know, passenger surveys, what is it? It's 10 or 15 standard questions, isn't it? From very satisfied to not very satisfied. Guess where the scores were on this one, but anyway. <laughs> on standard things. So what are they going to find out? So it goes, they get put together, and it goes to the market research department back at KLA. What are they going to find out? Are they going to find out that they didn't have some very happy passengers? Yes, because I suspect most of the scores would not have been good. Are they going to find out why those passengers were not happy? Don't know. Possibly. Somebody might have said, you kept us waiting or something. But are they really going to understand what drove that dissatisfaction from a set of standardized questions? Are they really going to understand what it was like to be like this for 15 minutes? <laughs> that it was actually about the fact that we weren't told what was going on that was the issue? Those, probably not, unless somebody's written lots of paragraphs. And that's the problem. And that's the problem about insight. How could you have found out? The only way you could have really discovered what it was like to be a customer in that circumstance was what? To have been there and seen it. That's the only way you could have done it. And customer observation, to me, is the only way to get real customer insight. Of course you need data because you need to understand trends and you need lots of market research. But also, we've got to be better at actually getting out and observing because it's only when you experience it that you realize sometimes that it can be little things that drive it, not necessarily big things. So I'm a big believer that you've actually got to be there and see it to really understand what it's like and what soft insights are about.